All right, welcome to the second annual Larry Golding Bridging the Gap lecture and annual scholarship presentation. We've got a few preliminary items to handle this morning and before we bring up our keynote speaker. So I'd like to start by talking about that crazy event that happened in here last night. Was anyone there? Was anyone in here last night? Sweating through the ages? Well, Propel hosted the Sweating Through the Ages Team Boot Camp Challenge last night. The event was part of ACSM's long-standing partnership with Propel, and we think a fun new addition to the summit schedule. So, without much further ado, I'd like to announce the winners that walked away with the prizes last night. Coming in third, under the leadership of Team Captain Avery Fagenbaum was Team Black Cherry. Are they in the room? Doesn't sound like they have a lot of energy left. <laughs> if you had seen the 90 second high intensity intervals they were doing all, you would understand. Second place went to Team Lemon with Melissa Lane. <laughs> and the first place winners of the first Propel Team Boot Camp Challenge was Kelly Roberts Team Kiwi Strawberry. That's pretty lame, pretty lame. <laughs> so we'd like to thank Propel for their ongoing support of the event and of course the summit. So uh, this lecture, before we start the lecture, I'd first like to start by honoring a long-term contributor to the ACSM Health and Fitness Journal. He was honored this morning at the journal's uh, meeting um, and had to leave, but I just want to say that Dr. Jim Peterson is stepping down after 20 years of leadership to the ACSM Health and Fitness Journal. Those that read the journal may recognize uh, Jim from the Take 10 column writer that is at the back at every issue. He was a summit committee member of the very first summit and for many of the early summits and a speaker for many years. So I'd just like to acknowledge Jim's contribution. So this lecture was started last year in honor of the founder of the summit, a longtime ACSM leader, Dr. Larry Golding. Uh, he was the chair of the first 12 summits, the founding editor of the Health and Fitness Journal. It was, it was Dr. Golding's vision for the American College of Sports Medicine to have an event as well as resources for the health and fitness professional. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, his concern was that much of the, the great science and research that was being done through the American College of Sports Medicine was, was not uh, being captured in translation down to the practical, the practitioners that use it with people and clients uh, throughout the country. So this was his vision, uh, combined journal, summit, as well as the uh, alliance membership. So this uh, lecture was instituted last year to honor uh, his contributions. So at this lecture, we'll also, we are going to honor the winner of the Larry Golding Scholarship. The 2016 winner was uh, chosen from 10 applicants for the scholarship. It's for students uh, who are looking for, to further careers in the health and wellness field. We had 10 applicants. The winner receives a $1,000 check, enrollment in the summit, and $1,000 of merchandise at the Healthy Learning Store. And I'm pleased to announce the winner who's here with us today is Macon Hammond from North Carolina Wesleyan College, right here in front. Macon. <clears throat> Macon is here he's with his family, his mom and dad and sister. They drove down from North Carolina to be with us, so let's welcome them as well. So he's graduating in May, as you can see, with a BS in exercise science and hopes to go on and become a cardiologist and support the exercise as medicine initiative. So it's indeed fitting uh, that we honor him this morning. At this point, I'd like to bring up committee member Amy Bidwell, who's going to introduce our keynote speaker. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. That was good. <laughs> it is my pleasure to introduce um, our president-elect for ACSM, Dr. Joy. 
Dr. Joy is the medical director of the community health at Inter Intermountain Healthcare in Salt Lake City. In addition, Dr. Joy practices family medicine and sports medicine at the Salt Lake City Levee Health Wealth Center. She is an adjunct professor at University of Utah in the Department of Family and Preventative Medicine. You can see why I didn't memorize this. <laughs> she completed a family medicine residency and primary care sports medicine fellowship at Hennepin County Medical Center in Minneapolis. She also completed her master's degree in public health at University of Utah. Dr. Joy is currently the president-elect of the American College of Sports Medicine and formerly served on the board of trustees as well as vice president. She has held two terms of office for the <coughs> board of trustees at the American Medical Society. She is the editorial board for the Clinical Journal of Sports Medicine and is associate editor for Current Sports Medicine Reports. She also serves as the Exercise is Medicine Steering Committee for ACSM and chairs the Exercise is Medicine Clinical Practice Committee. She developed and directed the Primary Care Sports Medicine Fellowship Program at the University of Utah from 1998 to 2010. She has authored many journal articles and textbook chapters on a wide variety of topics such as sports and exercise medicine. Her research and advocacy interests lie in the areas of physical activity assessment and promotion, the female athlete triad, sports injury prevention, and diabetes prevention. It is with great honor that I introduce this morning Dr. Joy to you. I feel like I should dance or something. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much. It's really great to be here and certainly an honor to present the Larry Golding Lecture on Exercise as Medicine. You know, and as a, a doctor who's actually more interested in health care than disease care, I got to tell you that exercise as medicine is, is pretty much a professional dream come true for me. And what I'd like to share with you today is the development and implementation of exercise as medicine. And we're going to finish up with a real-world application of exercise as medicine, or exercise as medicine in action, as I'd like to say. You know, and before I launch into a discussion of EIM, though, I really want to take a moment and highlight the recent Step It Up campaign and call to action by our Surgeon General, Dr. Vivek Murthy. I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, are familiar with the Step It Up program, which promotes walking and walkability in our communities. And I'd just like to say that Dr. Murthy and the American College of Sports Medicine would like to ask each of you as individuals to take the pledge and sign up for this very important initiative. And this is what it means to take the Step It Up pledge. We're asking each of you to keep abreast of activities that are related to the call to action, pledge to walk for personal health and encourage others to do so, share walking and physical activity messages within your own personal sphere of influence, promote, encourage, and recognize others in your community who are engaged in this effort. And what you see here in the lower right-hand corner is the website to go to pledge to step it up. And I really do encourage all of you to take the pledge yourself and to be examples in your own community of all of our efforts to promote walking and walkability in our communities. So I think this is really the perfect segue to the rest of my presentation. And I love this quote from Dr. Robert Butler that says, if exercise could be packed in a pill, it would be the single most widely prescribed and beneficial medicine in the nation. I actually think I want that tattooed on me. <laughs> you know, but he's far from the first to recognize the importance of regular exercise. Even our founding fathers promoted regular exercise and play you know, as essential for our health and well-being. And I'll start with this quote from Thomas Jefferson that says, leave all afternoon for exercise and recreation, which are necessary as reading. I will say rather more necessary because health is worth more than learning. But sadly, you know, that's really not the case here in the United States. And we need programs like exercise and medicine because in the US only about 14% of women and 27% of men engage in regular physical activity. 
You know, half of all adults in the United States are estimated to be obese by the year 2030, and physical inactivity is estimated to cause one in 10 premature deaths worldwide. Those are pretty sobering statistics. And some would say that physical inactivity is the biggest public health problem of the 21st century. So that's kind of on the patient side. On the physician side, we're not doing that much better. Only about 30 to 40 percent of patients report receiving counseling from their physician at their last doctor's visit. You know, whether you're talking about physicians or patients, I think it's pretty safe to say that we have room for improvement. So these are the objectives of my presentation this morning. I'm going to start by providing just an overview of the Exercises Medicine program and talk about its development and core principles, its leadership, reach, and organizational structure, the elements of the program. I want to highlight for you something we call EIM 2.0, or the second phase of EIM. And then it, we'll finish up with an application of EIM in a healthcare system. So Exercises Medicine was launched in um, November of 2007 by both the American College of Sports Medicine and the American Medical Association. And it was really developed to encourage primary care physicians to include exercise when designing treatment plans for patients. And the program is really committed to the belief that exercise and physical activity are integral to the prevention and treatment of disease, and as such, should be assessed as part of medical care and integrated into every primary care office visit. So I think the words of Steve Blair and Tim Church, published back in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2004, really rang true for the, those who were involved in the development of exercises medicine. And I think this quote is so important, I'm going to read it to you. It says, the medical community needs to lead in communicating the importance of physical activity for health and weight maintenance. Just as weight is addressed in some manner at nearly every physician visit, so should attention be given to recommending the accumulation of 30 minutes a day of moderate intensity physical activity at least five days of the week. Now I'm going to take a little informal poll here. I want you to think back to your last doctor's visit. You know, how many of you were weighed? How many of you had your blood pressure checked? And how many of you had your physical activity assessed? <laughs> Not very many. And there's a reason for that. And the reason is, is that, you know, prior to really the development of exercise as medicine program, we didn't have tools and processes and systems and strategies around physical activity assessment and promotion in the doctor's office. I think it's pretty intuitive that it should be part of healthcare delivery, but unless you, you add something in there systematically that it helps the physician, the exam room just gets too crowded with other priorities to talk about this. So exercise as medicine really calls on healthcare providers to assess and review every patient's physical activity program at every visit. And ultimately, EIM's goal is really this transformational change to institutionalize physical activity assessment and prescription into global healthcare systems. And this global initiative to establish physical activity as a standard in healthcare is now present in more than 40 countries around the globe. So let me share with you EIM's leadership and organizational structure. Bob Salas is a family physician at Kaiser Permanente, and he is the president of Exercises Medicine and started this initiative during his ACSM presidency. EIM is also led by Dr. Adrian Hutber, who some of you may have met earlier this week as part of the EIM certification program. Mark Stoutenberg, I failed to include Jennifer Prasarczyk on this slide, and Dr. Felipe Lobello leads our Global Research Center. It has an advisory board with 19 members and eight uh, exercises medicine committees, including those listed here. And I have the pleasure of, of chairing the clinical practice committee. So exercises medicine, as I mentioned, is kind of in transition. Our phase one really was from its origin in 2007 through 2013, and was largely focused on developing its infrastructure and raising awareness of the exercises medicine program around the globe. We've now moved on to AEIM Phase 2, or EIM 2.0, which is really focused on um, program, further program development and delivery, as well as a very robust evaluation process to demonstrate that EIM is making a difference in the lives of our communities. So we have something called the EIM Solution, which is really defined as a community-based extension of healthcare for at-risk, 
population groups that's aimed at physical activity promotion by really providing this high touch continuum of care that goes from health care all the way into health and fitness and back again. So in the very simplest of terms, it's really about connecting. It's about connecting health care providers and patients with health and fitness professionals and programs in order to achieve, to help people achieve active health outcomes. And at the healthcare provider level, we define a three-step process that starts with physical activity assessment, using a physical activity vital sign, typically embedded within an electronic health record, and that's followed by an exercise as medicine prescription that helps us to provide the right dose of exercise for that individual. And oftentimes, at the conclusion of a prescription, it will lead to a referral, and that referral may be to a health and fitness professional, it may be to a community-based physical activity program, or it may be into a self-directed physical activity program of the patient's choice, because we want people to be active their way. And I think that is so important, be active your way. So let's go back to the physical activity assessment part, because that's really where it all starts. I mean, if we don't know how much activity you know, they're currently doing, we don't really know how to counsel them to achieve recommended levels of physical activity. And the physical activity vital sign is typically a two or three question tool that determines minutes per day, days per week, total minutes per week of, of physical activity along with intensity. It is typically assessed during the course of a, a clinical office visit, usually in a primary care setting, but it certainly can be done so in a specialty care setting and then recorded in the electronic health record. I want to show you two examples of physical activity vital signs that are currently in practice. The first comes from Kaiser Permanente. This is in the EPIC electronic health record, and some of you uh, may actually chart in an electronic health record, or your medical records may be in EPIC. Um, but this uh, particular vital sign was developed by Dr. Salas and is used broadly throughout the entire Kaiser Permanente um, healthcare system. This is what the physical activity vital sign looks like in uh, Intermountain Healthcare's electronic health record. And it asks a number of questions on average, how many days a week do you perform physical activity or exercise? On average, how many total minutes of physical activity or exercise do you perform? The electronic health record automatically multiplies those together to give us minutes per week. And then individuals are asked to describe the intensity of the physical activity or exercise they participate in. Light is considered a casual walk, moderate a brisk walk, and vigorous is jogging. And you can see that these are recorded within the electronic health record. And I might add this has great product placement. It's right on the right hand side of the vital sign bar and you can see it the minute you log into the electronic health record. It's not buried a couple of pages deep. And then this last box here it says start, increase, or maintain. And this is for the healthcare provider to complete. And it requires that they have seen the vital sign, they have interpreted the vital sign, and they have made a determination that that person, based on both their vital sign plus their medical conditions, their health conditions, they are then counseled to either start, increase, or maintain their physical activity program. We recently also implemented a pediatric physical activity vital sign, which looks quite different from the adult vital sign. And it asks, on average, how many days per week does your child get at least 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity or play, defined as heart beating faster than normal and breathing harder than normal? And we asked the question that way because we thought it might be hard, you know, for a six-year-old to tell us minutes per day and days per week of moderate intensity activity. The pediatric vital sign goes on to ask some very specific questions about activities that we know children and adolescents are more likely to participate in. And we want to know on most days of the week, does your child walk or bike to school, participate in physical education, participate in organized physical activity or play, and have less than two hours of recreational screen time. So following the physical activity vital sign is the exercise as medicine prescription, um, which again, these recommendations are based not only on the PAVs, but also their medical history, their health goals, and of course are based on evidence-based guidelines from the American College of Sports Medicine. And we recently released an, an updated version of our Exercises Medicine exercise prescription. And I would encourage you to look at this. It's on the EIM website. Um, but it specifically calls out um, aerobic activity as well as strength training, 
Um, and uh, again, in, from the perspective of try and be active your way, um, it encourages people to walk or run or swim or bike or find something else. How many days per week are you uh, recommending? At what intensity? How many minutes? Some people using um, step counters, accelerometers, and smartphone apps may find that um, tracking their steps is uh, most helpful. And on the back side of the exercises medicine prescription includes some educational information about what do we know about physical activity, about aerobic activity, strength training, and how to get started. In addition to the exercises medicine prescription on our website, we also have a number of educational handouts um, as part of the Your Prescription for Health series um, that discuss exercise with various health conditions. And so now we've had the physical activity vital sign and exercises medicine prescription. Next comes the referral. And that referral, as I mentioned previously, may be to an exercises medicine pro professional. It may be to a community-based physical activity program. Um, or it may, and, and probably most likely, oftentimes it's, it's going to go into a self-directed program. And certainly the patients that I work most closely with, if they have low exercise self-efficacy, you know, they may have limited resources. Oftentimes we're going to start out with a walking program, but we'll come back to that a little bit later. You know, in terms of referral sources, you know, we continue to struggle in the fact that most of our third-party payers, our insurance companies, they're not paying for physical activity program, except for some of the Medicare Advantage programs, such as Silver Sneakers. Our healthcare system has a $20 per member per month fitness benefit that um, members of our Medicare Advantage program can apply towards personal training, towards a gym membership, even towards purchasing running or walking shoes. So there's definitely um, efforts by our, um, our payer system to try and incentivize more physical activity participation, but this is definitely in its infancy. And there are other professionals that all of us work with um, who can help us in promoting activity with patients. And right now, uh, physical therapy can be appropriate, for example, for a patient with underlying neuromuscular or musculoskeletal conditions that may be hampering their ability to exercise. And they may be a great first start or a segue from the physician's office into um, health and fitness. The same is true for patients with known cardiopulmonary disease. It may be most appropriate for them to start their exercise program with a cardiopulmonary rehab specialist. And I love that exercise as medicine is working with our dietitians. And I have to call out um, Melinda Menor and others who created the EIM toolkit for registered dietitians. This is an outstanding tool that really was aimed at educating our registered dietitians about how to also prescribe exercise as part of a healthy lifestyle counseling. And right now, many of these services can be paid for through insurance companies. But really the end goal of all of this is that no patient should leave a physician's practice without an assessment of his or her physical activity and an exercise prescription and or referral to a qualified fitness or allied health professional for further counseling. And as I mentioned, EIM's goal is really about connecting healthcare providers and patients with health and fitness opportunities broadly defined. And again, that may be to an EIM professional, to a program, to local programs in, in communities, as well as to self-directed exercise, with the whole idea being be active your way. I just want to mention the EIM credential. I know there was a workshop here earlier in the uh, summit. Um, the purpose of the EIM credential really is around expanding the knowledge and skill of health and fitness professionals so that you feel confident um, and, uh, and competent to work safely and effectively with clients who have underlying health conditions and are really comfortable working with physicians and other healthcare professionals in delivering the absolute highest standard of physical activity programming. And I would encourage you to reach out to the EIM staff if you have additional questions about the EIM credential and how it might fit best with your professional practice. Our certified EIM professionals you know, are trained to deliver physical activity uh, intervention programs that include one-on-one um, -on -one physical activity training, um, health education, as well as um, group exercise classes. Uh, EIM credentialed professionals can be um, credentialed at three different levels. 
depending on the type of clients that they're working with, low, moderate, or high risk participants. I also want to mention that the EIM staff um, at both at the ACSM central office as well as at our EIM national centers around the world, you know, are working to develop this network of EIM professionals, of EIM qualified programs, and EIM recognized places that can deliver physical activity programming to patients and to community members. And keeping in mind that these may be referred from healthcare settings, from employers, from insurance companies, as well as community members who self-refer into programs such as that. And these EIM programs and places really are a community-based network that represent a variety of places to experience regular physical activity, such as community centers, you know, parks and recreation facilities, hospital wellness centers, medical fitness centers, YMCAs, and many others. So there is a breadth of organizations and programs that kind of we welcome into this entire EIM umbrella. And I really want to connect back to the Surgeon General's call to action on walking and walkability in the Step It Up um, program because, again, a majority of individuals are going to meet recommended levels of physical activity through walking. And walking is so incredibly accessible um, to most people. And, you know, regardless of age, gender, you know, race, ethnicity, you know, a, a vast majority of Americans are walking. And on average, you know, a U.S. adult um, spends about 13 minutes a day walking or 90 minutes a week. So it doesn't take that much more, you know, to get them up to the recommended, recommended level of 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity physical activity. And at least when I'm seeing my patients who are sedentary or insufficiently active, who may have low self-efficacy around physical activity, who may not have the resources to participate at a fitness facility or to work with a health and fitness professional, I often start them in a walking program and encourage them to get at least 10 minutes. And when they can safely do 10 minutes, work them up to 20 minutes. And if they can do 20 minutes, try and get them up to 30 minutes. So the future model of exercise as medicine is not only connecting, you know, healthcare providers, you know, and patients with health and fitness professionals, but it's really looking at the entire healthcare system you know, where we have here in the middle something that we define as physical activity intervention advisors, you know, who promote enrollment, who assess readiness, who may actually be the ones developing and delivering the exercise as medicine prescription and referral. And this advisor may also come by different names. You know, in your system, it, it might be a care manager or it might be a health and wellness coach. But whoever is in that role, we hope that healthcare systems start to invest in this type of person who can kind of help the clinician and the patient um, in, in promoting uh, physical activity. We also want to partner with the payers of healthcare. As I mentioned, right now there's very limited third party reimbursement for physical activity. We're grateful for the, the Medicare Advantage programs that provide a fitness benefit for those members. Um, but we hope that employer based health insurance programs, as well as other commercial payers, also start to support um, physical activity programming for their uh, members. And we also need to link with public health and philanthropy to ensure that we're developing programs that reach our most vulnerable and our underserved um, patients. So I would be remiss if I didn't mention other EIM programming. And uh, I really want to call out the EIM on campus program um, that was uh, developed by a former ACSM president, Dr. Jim Pavarnik. Um, which has really been broadly and widely successful on campuses around the country um, and is largely supported by um, undergraduates and graduate students in health promotion and wellness and exercise science. Um, Dr. Eddie Phillips and Dr. Jennifer Trilk are leading the development of a, a medical student curriculum and EIM is launching into physician training both worldwide and here in the United States to try and, and elevate the knowledge and skill of physicians um, in terms of, of prescribing exercise with their patients. 
I mentioned previously that we're uh, in the process of, of developing a very robust evaluation program for exercises medicine so that we can um, demonstrate its success. And uh, we're just rolling out an EAM emerging leader program to encourage people like yourselves and others to be uh, more involved in exercises medicine and to be um, uh, really ambassadors of the program in your local communities. And again, I encourage all of you to go to the exercisesmedicine.org website to learn more. So as in a summary, I just really want to say thank you to the summit um, program planners for letting me share this exercises medicine story with you this morning. Um, and I want to just you know, say that I'm, I'm a real world example you know, of a physician who has very strong ties to her local health and fitness community. And I, I regularly refer to this guy on the right um, because he can help my patients achieve this. <laughs> All right, so I, when I was putting together this keynote presentation, I thought, well, you know, I can stand up there and talk at them for an hour, or I can invite others to join me on the stage and really kind of give you an example of exercise as medicine in action. And so um, thanks to the, the help and assistance of Jennifer Prasarczyk and the EIM staff, we have invited um, three people who are going to join me on the stage and we're going to have a moderated discussion about how exercise as medicine actually works. So I'd like to invite our, our guests to the stage, um, Bill. Karen and Frank. So Bill Kelly is a, um, a clinical exercise physiologist at the Celebration Fitness Center at the Florida Hospital Celebration Health. And Dr. And Karen Wersinski is a nurse who is the Women's Clinical Care Coordinator at Florida Celebration Health. And they have brought with them Frank Santino, who is a bariatric patient and um, had the opportunity to uh, train in their medical fitness center. And so well, for the remainder of our time, uh, what I'd like to do is um, propose a few questions for you guys to answer. Uh, and, um, and hopefully that will lead to some additional discussion um, with folks in the audience. So, so we're going to start with you, Bill. Um, so you work in a healthcare setting as part of a medical fitness center, and can you share with us how you interact with physicians on the front end, um, i.e., having patients referred to you for a exercise prescription and program, and then how do you circle back with the physician, you know, after that individual has come to to see you? Guys, hear me all right? Okay. Um, actually, I see patients either through integration, where, where I'm part of the physician's practice, or linkage through service lines. So, so I'm super excited to be here today. But remember, when I went to Celebration, this was about 2001, and we had a fitness center, state-of-the-art fitness center out there, but we were run mainly as a commercial fitness center. So my big role was, hey, that's my end to the hospital. How can I kind of spread out to physicians? And the fitness center was all about that, but they were saying, well, you know, you got our blessings, go ahead. So one of the first ways we got in was with the bariatric program. That's the program I'm the most integrated with, and that's what Frank went through. And basically, I kind of cherry pick physicians. We had a new bariatric surgeon coming in, Dr. Keith Kim, and basically I haunted him until <laughs> he kind of sat down and said, well, what do you want? And I said, hey, you got bariatric patients. Is there any way that, you know, don't, don't you need some exercise education? And he said, yeah, I need 15 minutes once a week for a three hour lecture to tell him a little bit about the importance of exercise. But from there, we developed a whole procedure where now bariatric patients are required to see me for metabolic testing before they come in. We do follow up with them. And basically, 
I don't do a lot with Dr. Kim because the patients are following up with me. So basically he said, you're the expert, you're gonna to talk to them. And then when they're ready for a structured exercise program, of course we have this terrific facility right next door where we will do discounts for medical patients. From bariatrics, we have different service lines and, and Karen is one of the coordinators. So as I got on the different service lines, not all of them are very, as integrated as bariatrics. So I have linkage there. What do you mean by linkage? Well, this is where maybe a patient is coming in and maybe they are uh, having a hysterectomy and the doc tells Karen, you know, the person is 40 pounds overweight, they need physical therapy, they need this. So Karen coordinates with the right professionals. So most of these people aren't even candidates for exercising. They're scared, they're sick. So when they come in to see me, I sit down, I kind of look at what is your BMI? What is your body fat? Why is the doctor concerned with you? And then we get back to, hey, by the way, are you walking? Are you doing anything? And most people said, well, yeah, of course I walk. But then we quantify it. Well, how many steps a day? Are you measuring that? Or if you're exercising, you check once a week and you say 20 minutes, well, we've got maybe a start of a habit, but that's not gonna be the right dosage. So that's how I've kind of came around. And we're growing and we're getting more integration in there, but basically that's how I started at Celebration and that's how we're linking more through the service centers and trying to integrate more into the practices. Thank you very much. So Karen, we're gonna to segue to you next, all right? So, you know, as a nurse, you probably have more one-on-one -on -one time with the patient than sometimes a physician has in their very packed, overcrowded, 15 to 20 minute office visit. You know, and, and you may be, you know, sometimes less intimidating, you know, than the patient who says to the physician or doesn't want to say to the physician, I, I'm, I'm scared. You know, I find that patients don't want to tell me that they're scared to do something that I'm asking them to do. So if you've got somebody who's got low self-efficacy, low self-efficacy around exercise, they, they may be uh, nervous. I think about some of the breast cancer patients I know you work with. You know, they may be concerned that exercise might hurt them or make their condition worse. How do you counsel them? How do you assess their readiness um, and their willingness to participate in a physical activity program and refer them into Bill's program? It's already here. Okay. So, um, you know, there's a couple ways, a couple things that we do. Our patients, when they come to us, if you uh, spoke specifically about the breast cancer patients, they are very scared. Um, we have multiple service lines at my hospital. I am a uh, employee of the hospital, not an employee of the doctor's offices, okay? So you're gonna find people like me in many different areas. Of, um, of the facilities that you work in. But specifically at Celebration, we have a service line coordinator like myself. I, I have a nursing background, but um, labor and delivery was my old, my old job, and I did that for 16 years. Then I graduated to the gynecology side of things and function as a care coordinator. Um, we are the buffer between the doctor's office and the hospital. Uh, we are the, page, the, the patient support person, the advocate. There's a couple things that are goals that you'll start off with when you go in to see the patient. I go in with the physician to talk to the patients that are going to be directed towards me. Sometimes that'll be set up in advance. Sometimes a doctor will call me in after when they're seeing the patient. Um, my patients are mostly gynecology. They're mostly not cancer related. The, the breast cancer patients do, they are actually integrated into Bill's program. I'm one of the linkage people. So there are two goals at the beginning when I go in. I want to establish a rapport with the patient and I want to educate the patient, start that process. They might have gotten a, a, a diagnosis that they weren't ready to get. Um, they might have known what their diagnosis is, but they didn't know they were gonna have to lose 25 pounds or decrease their hemoglobin A1C um, get their cardiovascular health back up uh, to, a, to a more healthy state, which will give them a good outcome and a good recovery, so they're scared. They also, sometimes you'll have a physician that doesn't have the best bedside manner, so you go in um, to kind of calm them down after they've seen. I'm, sh I'm sure that's not you, Dr. Joy. Oh, no. <laughs> Pre present company excluded. Um, 
So I go, I, I can't say the same for all of my physicians. I'm just saying, yeah, they're fabulous, fabulous rock star surgeons and doctors that I work with at Celebration Health, but we do, we do collaborate as a team. So that establishing of that rapport is one of the first things that you want to do. Um, you might, you know, they might have already talked a little bit about exercise, getting into that exercise program. I actually have a list, a checklist of items in addition to exercise that I'm going, um, going to talk about with the patient. Exercise, uh, they might need to uh, see the nutritionist, they might need to go to the physical therapist, pain management, so we're going to go through all of those. Uh, when, I, when I specifically talk about exercise, you might say to a patient before starting that conversation, um, you know, what's important to you? What's important to you to, for c coming into this treatment plan? They may be saying, you, you will be very surprised what you hear. Some might be afraid about the pain. Some might be, um, they just want to get back to, to work quicker. They haven't been able to play with their children or grandchildren for a long period of time. So you're going to get down to a personal level with those patients and, and find out what's important. That's going to open up the conversation to the next, the, the next uh, phase, which is the education part. So for example, if a patient is saying that um, they have to get back to work quicker, well, we know that a patient that can uh, have a minimally invasive uh, surgery will advocate, we, will, um, will give the patient a better outcome. They're going to have less time in the hospital. They're going to have less pain. They're going to be able to get back to their everyday activities quicker. So, you know, <clears throat> when you're talking about that with a patient, they're going to start being receptive to those things. When you talk about saying whether um, a patient is worried because they're on a lot of pain medicine and what their pain is going to be like, then you're going to talk about that a little bit more. They're also concerned about um, possibly having to change their diet. So just opening up that door uh, makes them empowered because they have uh, that knowledge and understanding and makes them feel a little bit more comfortable. Um, then what I'll go into is talking about, okay, so with what you're saying, you'd like to accomplish this, this, and this. The big picture is the surgery, but all of these other uh, multidisciplinary parts of our program are gonna get you to that big picture of feeling better once you're done. Um, a happy, and then two other uh, things that we, like, we talk about in healthcare, big buzzwords right now, are um, patient satisfaction and patient outcomes. So a happy patient is going to promote, I don't know um, how many of you are in actual in healthcare, but they fill out actual um, evaluations about us in their federal government type of evaluations called Press Ganey and HCAPS. Now, if you have a patient that's not happy with their outcome, right, they, they, they didn't lose the weight, they didn't change their diet, they didn't get to where they needed to be, but the surgery was evident and was going to happen anyway. Um, they're not, they're, they're not going to get the result that they wanted, so they're not going to be as happy checking their little boxes, right, to get to after they have their surgery. And that checking of those boxes directly relates back to how you, you are reimbursed. So there's two sides to that coin, right? You want a happy doctor and you want a happy patient. Um, that's just the, the face of our, of our healthcare right now. And actually, all in all, it just makes a positive experience because if the government is, is, is kind of uh, looking at that a little bit, then it's going to make a better patient outcome. It's going to make a better, a better overall situation. The second thing is outcomes, which is also a direct relation to, um, for, to payment and reimbursement. We are uh, looked at by if we don't have positive uh, outcomes related to infection, patients coming back in after they have had their surgery um, 30 days post-operatively because their wound isn't healing. Those are, those are other things that you can talk with your physicians about and say, you know, I can help you. I can help you with um, your, your uh, press gainy scores. I can help you with your outcomes. Because a patient that is suffering from low cardiovascular, a, BM, a, a BMI that's over, over 30, um, their hemoglobin A1C that's above seven, 
is going to have trouble healing. They're going to be prone to infection. So these are, these are just wonderful ways to integrate the whole, uh, the whole picture of exercise as medicine and um, making a positive result. Thank you so much. I, you know, Celebration Health is so incredibly lucky to have both Bill and you working there. It's just phenomenal. Um, you guys are a resource that most places don't have, and uh, we hope that the Exercise as Medicine program really helps to promote integration of health and fitness professionals and service line coordinators like yourself that can help to kind of connect patients through their physician and um, health and fitness um, to the right programs for their own personal needs, which is a great segue to Frank. And Frank, we're so um, pleased that you could join us this morning to share your story and kind of your path from, you know, having been a patient to now, I guess, being an athlete and working with Bill. And if you would share kind of uh, what that experience was like for you and, and how, do, how do people like Bill become part of your healthcare team? Well, to start off with, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, I was almost 300 pounds uh, nine years ago when I decided to have the uh, bariatric surgery through my uh, home, yeah, my personal physician suggested going to Celebration Health for uh, an orientation of bariatric surgery because it was too, too heavy and maybe I wasn't doing enough exercise to offset some of my, my problems. And I went to the orientation and chose to have the bariatric surgery. But before you have the bariatric surgery, you have to go through an orientation, the, uh, the metabolism test. Uh, you speak with a psychologist and several other professionals. I spoke to Bill Kelly about getting into an exercise program because that was part of the orientation. If you get into an exercise program shortly after your surgery, you will build up some of your muscle mass that you lost and turn some of your fat into muscle as you're losing, losing the weight. And uh, so I spoke to Bill a couple, about a month or so before the surgery to tell him I was going to have this. I'd like you as a trainer or a personal guide to help me through this procedure because it's like a strain on your body that you're going to be losing a lot of weight. and you got to keep yourself motivated to make everything work out what you're going through. Uh, there's a lot of ups and downs about the surgery, and, but the exercise program kept my mind straight that I'm going to do this every, every day. I saw bills roughly three times a week for almost two years, and not because of the procedure, but so, so much for the procedure, but then I wanted to keep on doing it and stay with the program. And I felt by doing the program with Bill at the fitness center, uh, I did, lost a lot of weight, which is about 130 pounds. Wow. But in the process, I didn't have any excess baggage skin. Uh, you know. Not too much of this, <laughs> but I mean, I do have a little bit, but it's not noticeable. And by staying with the program and doing the exercise, and he'd come up with new, new ideas, I want you to try this. Every single procedure that he came up with, I tried, and I never refused it. Some I could do the exercise, some I couldn't the first time. <laughs> but he says, let's try it a little later on in the program. So instead of doing a set of 10, I could probably do five. The next day or the next time, I could do eight. By the end of the week, I could do the, the 10 sets that he wanted me to do there. And then we progressed up to 20. And then after we did that for so many weeks, he got bored and says, I got a new procedure for you. <laughs> All over again, we had to go through the same thing. I thank him for helping me and a lot of other patients. I go through a support group for the barrier for patients, and I'm in the advanced group. And once a year, I give a little 
spiel or speech to the new patients that have just had the surgery. Stress it, get into an exercise program. Therefore, you're not gonna have this. <laughs> but keep with it. Don't feel because you, you lost 100 pounds in a year that you, you can't stop. Keep up a steady pace, maybe not as, think, again, like Dr. Liz said, at least 30 minutes a day. I do roughly 15 or 20 minutes of walking type exercise a day, but I also do about 20 minutes to a half hour in the pool at night, just doing different exercises. Like I say, it's been nine years and I've maintained 130 pounds off. I brought a couple of pictures that I left at the chair if somebody wants to see them later on of old fatso down to what I am. <laughs> and, I, and I can say thank to him and this procedure that I'm an altogether different person. I'm half of what I used to be but I gained at least 10 or 15 more years to my life. Yeah, That's right. Well, I can't think of a better example of exercise as medicine than this. And I really do want to thank Bill and Frank and Karen for joining us today. Let's give them another round of applause. Well, again, I, I thank you for your time and your attention and for joining us here this morning. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks again.